Welcome to Psychological Explorations with Dr. Michael Axelman. And Daniela. And John. We'll be discussing Maurice Nichol and his paper, Why is the Unconscious Unconscious? which was delivered and published in 1918. First, a bit on Maurice Nichol. He was a, a neurosurgeon, a Scottish neurosurgeon of great esteem. And he went under analysis uh, with Jung and was quite influenced by this experience and became involved in uh, the psychoanalytic movement in the UK. After some time, he got swept up by Gurdjieff and Uspensky. And he went on to write, uh, you know, five volume psychological commentaries on Uspensky and Gurdjieff. Uh, just a, a wonderful collection that moved his thinking in a totally different direction than we'll be exploring today. Today, we'll be taking up this topic of the unconscious. And it's been around the unconscious for, uh, well, I guess the 1700s is kind of when this conception moved into Europe. By the 1800s, it was really becoming more common in people's understandings. And then it came into a point in the 1870s and 1880s where it was quite fashionable to be talking about the unconscious. And it, it became part of kind of common vernacular, these conceptions. Um, so when we look back into the 19th century, we, we see a lot of people discussing the unconscious prior to Freud. Um, though Freud is really in many ways thought about as the first person who, who makes his theory governed by the unconscious so directly. Classical Freudian teaching on the unconscious, and I, I quote here from Nicole, the original teaching of Freud was that the unconscious part of the human psyche contained only what had once belonged to the conscious personal life. It became unconscious because it was repressed. It was repressed because it was painful or grossly antagonistic to conventional standards. The unconscious comes into existence during life of the individual as a result of repression it is therefore a secondary product. Okay, the unconscious here in classical Freudian as a secondary product, it comes from the repression. And we continue at birth, there is no unconscious. And at puberty, there is unconscious. And this unconscious is only a repressed part of the person's conscious experience. Largely the so-called infant sexuality. We can say that this kind of unconscious is like a cage opening off the main living room of consciousness into which we put the things that have become dangerous. The main task is to keep the door of the cage shut. If this door is not shut properly, we become neurotic or insane. So here Freud is talking about the way that infant sexuality impulses, aggressive impulses, aggressive thoughts, moving into consciousness is just too threatening, too disorganizing. And the need to keep this cage shut 
um, becomes one of the primary tasks of the healthy individual, according to this model. Contrasting Jung and Freud, and of course this famous break of Jung from Freud. To Jung, the primitive life force or libido is not sexuality, but an energy, one of whose manifestations is sexuality. What Freud calls the unconscious, Jung calls the personal unconscious. And this is but an excerpt from the collective unconscious, containing repressed and forgotten material that has had an intimate and personal significance. The roots of thought and feeling reach down beyond personal history, beyond the personal unconscious, into racial strata where lie the primordial thought feelings. And Freud did point to kind of racial memories. He reports this notion that there are some memories that are kind of archaic beyond beyond our birth. They're, they're kind of part of our generational that we carry forward. Um, and I go back to Nickel here quoting his distinctions between Jung and Freud, dreaming therefore precedes the function of language. Dreaming is pictorial language, a primitive way of thinking. Jung saw in the dream symbol a primitive and primary representation. Freud thought the dream symbol was not a real representation but something secondary, the outcome, as we discussed, of repression. So why is the unconscious unconscious, according to Nickel? And I quote, because it is not yet fully adapted to reality. The material is not adapted. The unconscious contains nascent thought, thought that has not yet been fashioned into the form that is useful to consciousness. The unconscious contains the raw material of the conscious life. It contains the germinal stuff, the bulbs and roots which exist below the surface because as such, they are unadapted and meaningless to us. Their blossoms are what we value. It is only when a man is insane that they come into conscious expression directly. And then we see how unadapted are his nascent fantasies. If this theory is valid, we must expect to find the unconscious through its product, the dream. Traces of all human qualities, the heroic and the upward striving, as well as the bestial. The forces of progression, as well as the forces of regression. So this wellspring of the totality of possibility and the dream becomes that pictorial language this contrast here between the bulbs and the roots that are under that are not yet manifested into consciousness this whole collection of raw material.
Regression towards nascent thought and raw material presents risk and opportunity. The collective unconscious consists of archaic human functions from which springs the myths. There is also the residue belonging to animal ancestry of mankind and ancestry which covers a vastly greater period than that of human existence. These archaic residues may become pathologically active when the life current or libido streams backwards from the hard task of reality. And this is called regression. Unless this energy can be freed up and pulled up, that is made available for conscious application, there will be tremendous danger to be dragged down beyond recall into the inexhaustible primordial fantasies of the collected unconscious. So either one is able to adapt what's breaking through into something usable in the life, making use of the life force in a progressive way, or else one gets pulled into that whole morass of raw material in a regressive way, leading to very poor adaptation with consciousness, with what we call reality, leading to poor reality testing in a clinical sense. John and Danielle, I wonder what your thoughts are reading this paper. Maybe I'll finish this last side real quick and then we'll move into discussion. Yeah, it. It's all right. Yes, all can be Sorry, fine. Michael, we were trying to unmute. <laughs> uh, making yeah. the unconscious conscious, transforming life force energy through conscious application. This is the Jungian directive here. And I quote from Nickel, unless this energy can be freed and pulled up, that is made available for conscious application, there will be tremendous danger to be dragged down beyond recall into the inexhaustible primordial fantasies of the collected unconscious. Thus, from this point of view, we must regard the unconscious as the inexhaustible source of our psychic life. And not only as a cage containing strange and odious beasts. And this is the conclusion of Nichols' paper here, contrasting the Freudian and Jungian conceptions of the unconscious. John and Daniela. Hey, Michael. Hey. Um, yeah, I think this is a really interesting essay. And I think um, a lot of people seem to have taken up this idea, um, you know, as, as you're lecturing today, I'm, I'm thinking of, for example, um, Carl Rogers, who I think said something along the lines of, uh, what is the most personal is the most universal. Um, I've also heard people say the personal is general, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I, so I think, you know, that people, I think have taken up that kind of line of, you know, well, actually a lot of what makes us, um, you know, the things that we sometimes consider to be the most personal, interesting, unique facts about us are actually shared by like many people. Right. I mean, we, as human beings right we have this kind of like endowment of a certain you know sort of and i think that's what he's getting at here right in the collective <laughs> unconscious like a certain kind of endowment from you know history right that kind of passed down historically over time and and you know this is something that we share right, as human beings and often is the source of a lot of what makes you know us able to you know communicate in ways that are you know comprehensible or whatever but uh, yes yeah, yes um yeah i thought it was a really a really interesting way to distinguish between 
those two understandings of the unconscious. What do you think? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. And what I, as I was listening to your lecture, Michael, I was two things came <laughs> struck out to me. And I wrote down <laughs> two questions. One, I was like, it was fashionable to talk about the unconscious back then, and I put an exclamation point. Like that'd be so interesting to just be able to just kind of view how people talked about it back in the. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but even before my other, my other, just I was just curious because. You said that people were talking about this before Freud, and I was just curious about who. Do you know? Like, yes. Was it philosophers? Was it theologians? Was it clergy? Um, I mean, there's an interesting about? book by a, a guy named White, W H Y T E, 1978. And the book is about the unconscious before Freud. Hmm. And I think, yes, I think if you go back, you can find this in kind of Descartes, in Hume, in Schopenhauer, um, all the way back to the Vedic text where they talk about Maya. There's a very similar connection between Maya and the collective unconscious. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask about like indigenous practices and you know something that uh you know my friends and I are you know oftentimes like I work with very di a very diverse group of people and folks but it's often the non-white folks who talk a lot about you know speaking to the ancestors mm -hmm. um and it made me think about what Fred was talking about with these the racial strata and um that this this idea of the unconscious you know has just existed pre-Freud and so I was just thinking about that and I think the other thing that stood out to me was the differences between Jung and Freud and I think the drama behind the two and their fallout and you know I kind of like drama in that way so. <laughs> yes <laughs> um I I know John knows a little bit about that I know you do too so Jung believed that these dreams were primary and Freud thought they were secondary. Do you both mind explaining that a little bit more? I, I'd like to understand it a little bit better. What that means, primary. Well, it's built, the whole notion of repression is, is primary for the, that Freudian idea. The repression takes the lead. Um. And the shift for Jung is more focusing on that, the, the capacity to adapt. I see. The adaptation to these forces in the unconscious to inform the life, right? Mm -hmm. So rather than being informed by that regressive impulse, finding that progressive, how to transform that into a progressive. I see. Yeah, well, because like for young, it's already there, right? Like at birth. And I think that's the thing, right? It's a primary in the sense that like we already have it. Whereas we're you know, embedded. Like, yes, we come into the world embedded into that oh, aspect. All right. Whereas like Nicholas is saying like, you know, at least his understanding of Freud is that whatever is unconscious arises after the fact, you know, like after repression does its work. And so everything in the unconscious then is secondary in that sense. It wasn't there mm -hmm. before, but now it is right. because repression did it. But I see. Um like, oh my gosh, I can't say that. Oh my, what am I thinking? Oh my God, you know, these <laughs> Yeah. But that's the experience of being overwhelmed by this breakthrough. Oh uh, right. Sexual content, aggressive content revenge content right whatever it might be oh yes that would overwhelm one's conception of who they are oh yes i've it can't be adapted i see yeah and i think that's you know we could do an entire you know episode or discussion just on the evolution of the idea of the unconscious after even this essay um you know he kind of begins that process here with this distinction 
collective and personal unconscious, but then see um, people continue that line of thought. Um, I'm thinking too of uh, like Milton Erickson, Mm -hmm. uh, how he started to understand the unconscious, um, you know, as like a font of like creativity. Um, And I think that's what Nichols getting at here too, is like it potentially is, but it's also potentially like, source of like brutality and all the other stuff as well you know not just the like striving and the the artistic and the beautiful but also like the the nasty and like the brutish and um, Mm -hmm. so that kind of integration of you know all the different parts um yeah you know that it's all of those so it's not just like we're not so it's kind of like destroying that whole like debate of like you know are human beings inherently good or inherently evil or whatever you know like kind of like all right, well, maybe we're past that now, you know, like we can yes. see plenty of both. Um, well, because, you know, I work with teenagers, right? And when teenage, when I have teenagers who come in and they're acting from a place of like not knowing just, um, and they've done something that they don't understand why they've done it or they've done something and they just know that there was an impulse to do it, you know, um, one thing. And then when you start saying, well, was it good or bad that I did this? And something that always without doubt blows the minds of a lot of the kids that I work with is they say, right. Like, well, sometimes good people do bad things. And then I say back to them and sometimes bad people do good things. So, you know, and then when I say that a lot of teenagers go, I never thought about that. (laughs) You're right. And so then I'll, we'll talk a little bit about how, you know, it might be a better use of our time to understand why you're doing what you're doing rather than labeling it with the judgment of good or bad. Mm-hmm. And that's really helpful with teens um, it, without fail. When I say, and sometimes bad people do good things and that <laughs> helps us go into that, you know, discussion of maybe it would be better for us to just try to gain some understanding as to why you did what you did versus nice. it was good or bad <laughs> it frees them up to reflect a little bit yeah exactly right and sometimes when i work with, like I've worked with clients before who engage in these uh like revenge dramas without knowing it and when i put words on that or when i help them sort of think it through in that way without judgment it's really freeing for them and they can sort of make this shift into a little bit more consciousness of why they're doing what they're doing. So often we work with children and adolescents and we ask them, you know, about their motivations Mm -hmm. and they say they don't know. Yes. (laughs) And we press them, you know, as if they're withholding, you know, rather than just accept it. They don't know. Exactly. They have not been able to get to this root of the motivation. Um, Exactly. They're engaged in behavior that they are not really aware of. Mm -hmm. It's governed, right, likely by these regressive forces. Yes. It's one thing, because we do a lot of trainings for our staff where I work, and we work with um, pre-K all the way until post uh, college graduation or like uh, career planning. And one of the things that we talk a lot to staff about is sometimes when a, a child says, I don't know, you know, it's because they really don't know. Mm. You just believe them. <laughs> yes. Sometimes we do things because we, and we don't understand why we do them. Well, and you can imagine how like, and if that, kind of questioning or that sort of like inquisition you know a kid faces like all the time every day you know like could you know very easily make them go kind of crazy right I mean not being able to being very scared of any impulse or kind of any sort of instinct they might have to kind of question it you know because they're they're not really sure but they, they know it's getting them in a lot of trouble and they don't know why it's kind of like that kind of crazy making behavior you know of um, yes Yes. Double binds all the time. Right on. Um, So in the work, how to help 
somebody become aware of some of these factors, right, that haven't been yet integrated into consciousness. Mm -hmm. It might be the way that an earlier trauma or abandonment is impacting behavior in a current relationship. Yes. And that's just totally split off in the moment. The person can only focus on the current relationship. And the awareness of this historical pattern is, is not in consciousness, right? Not able to make use of that aspect. Correct. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And then they're with somebody, ideally, who can hold that with them and be, uh, you know, provide this sort of experience with another person that maybe they didn't have at the first at the time you know the original mm -hmm. you know, event happened because i um i've worked with just for a couple of weeks now some young people and i they tell me about what they did last year and some of their um you know therapy and they'll talk about some of the insights they arrived at um in their you know therapy and you know then i'll ask them so what do you what do you do with that and they kind of take a second and then they look at me, they're like, mm, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's kind of like how, um, how can we bring it into awareness when that's helpful? And then at the same time, what, what to do with that is not really up to us, I guess, but how can we facilitate, you know, effective use of that awareness uh, mm -hmm. so that it's, um, it's not just kind of a fact about myself that I know. Um, it's also like, I, I might be able to make use of this somehow in my life to, for the better. Um, but that's, you know, that's like a whole separate, yes, you know, kind of journey or whatever, but, <laughs> but it's the step out of that, right? What, once you have some awareness, right. yeah, how do you move that into a change process? Mm -hmm. And it's actualized right through choices and decisions yes, in behaviors. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it is non-engaged, right? Learning to have an impulse and not act on it. Right. Right. Yeah. That containing, that holding of the tension state, right? And not releasing it into action, um, which happens unconsciously, right? Just to relieve the tension state. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was actually sitting with a, a patient client um, just the other day and they were talking about how frustrating their mother is and how their mother only says, and it was like a phrase basically of like, uh, like what the, like when the, the mother and the family get in fights, sort of the mother's response to, to the situation and how much it, it fear infuriates this client how much it makes him so upset and then he was talking about afterwards a situation with somebody that he is really interested in and how they got into a bit of a scuffle argument and then he repeated the exact thing that he told me that his mother always says that irritates him um, in connection to the mm. argument he was having with the person that he likes um, and I sort of just, you know, brought forward very gently how he was saying the exact same thing that his mother was saying. And then he looked at me and just started laughing. He goes, oh, my God, you're right. I'm just like my mom. <laughs> <laughs> and we just had a nice little chuckle about it. But um, and it was because the big thing for this client is like he doesn't want to replicate his parents relationship. Um, and so it was a good moment, Yes, but it was just a really fantastic moment. He literally said word for word, the exact thing that his mother said, um, in his first, oh, what a rich example. Yep. And had no idea of it. You know, this is very interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I have to look back at my notes to see what it was that he said. I can't remember exactly, but, um, <laughs> it was just spot on, just beautiful, you know? Yes. And he, we have a good rapport. So we are able to sort of you know, look at it with humor, um, rather than look like, rather than, cause sometimes when you bring those things up, it can feel accusatory. 
Um, so it's like yes. no to bring it in, you know? Yes. But because we have a good rapport and there's a lot of humor in our in our sort of relationship and whatnot, I was able to bring it into the room and show them sort of what was happening. Great example. Mm -hmm. hmm. Do we have any closing thoughts as we wind up today? Um, well, I guess like my last thought might be, you know, if like, is there any, I mean, this is more of like a, and this may come off as like a bit pedantic. I don't know, but just kind of, is there any, you know, like, should we just ref call it the unconscious in general? Like, is there any utility in like differentiating personal versus collective versus, you know, some other part, like, you know, like as if these are like hard sort of entities existing within a kind of like boundary together or, or really just kind of dynamic forces that inform one another, but it's all just the unconscious. Um, we don't need to maybe spend a lot of time thinking about, well, what's personal, what's collective. Maybe it's just the unconscious. I don't know. Yes. I mean, maybe the, the, there's more utility you're describing in kind of keeping it that way and not trying to split hairs. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's yeah, just something I'm thinking about. Like it's mm -hmm. all it's all kind of unconscious. Maybe the unconscious is a large reservoir and it's, you know, parts of it are us that we contribute, mm -hmm. you know, that are kind of our unique life history, but a lot of it is also just like a general human endowment, but it's all just kind of the unconscious maybe, I don't know. Right, <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. all that pool of raw material. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, vast, it's a vast reservoir of, of impulses, symbols, understandings. Um, yeah, I think to try to really put words on it in, in, a, in a more clear way, um, it's very difficult to do. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah i i have to say it's like definitely that concept of the unconscious was i think what really drew me to wanting to read more of freud and wanting to read more psychoanalysis this idea of this kind of really powerful force and it's very mysterious and you know like we may not have as much conscious control over things as we as we thought that kind of like freud's insult to humanity in the sense mm -hmm. of you know we we are not always the masters you know like of our of our minds or whatever and um and that was a really kind of captivating idea i think particularly when i was kind of believing that you know yeah maybe there there's just so much outside of of co our control and it's just sort of like futile to try mm -hmm. to you know we we try so hard uh to make things just so but it's um but you know we have all these kind of countervailing forces and then i think over time i started to you know, I think un understand the utility of, um, of of looking at at conscious life since that's where we, you know, like it's like well we still have to do something though, right? We still have to kind of um, make do with what we have, and so like there's contrary to what Freud you know believed about the unconscious being like this sort of mm -hmm. force, you know. Yes. Let's look at what we can do and like you know what we can control. Um, and not, you know, kind of like throw up our hands, kind of give up in the face of the unconscious. Um, That's it, right? Yeah. We kind of find that progressive impulse, that that way of adapting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, ourselves and, and, and that pressure. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, and we can see how the repression, the dissociation the disorganization, right? These regressive forces, how they really make it difficult for us to reach that place. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And it can be quite like stable and comfortable to stay in those places, you know, where there's a lot of inertia there, maybe, you know, like you don't have to do. Yes. Anything. Very familiar. Exactly. Um Mm -hmm. Thank you, Daniela, John. I appreciate your contributions today. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Psychological Explorations. 
look forward to having you join us in the future. Bye-bye for now. Thanks. Bye. Yeah.